And so uh, for those who are just joining us, and they will be uh, literally just joining us, uh, as I can see the numbers starting to click up uh, as we speak, for those uh, who are joining the uh, Friday Chamber web chat, as we like to call it, uh, we have five panellists, so I'll introduce you to in just a moment, and we see the numbers rapidly increasing as people are clicking online and joining us on the webinar. So we'll give everyone a couple of minutes. If you have just joined us, thank you very much indeed for doing so. Uh, you'll find that um, at the bottom buttons under there, you've got Q&A and you've got chat. Uh, if you've got questions or comments, you can use either of those two boxes, which will be monitored throughout and will be putting those questions, if we can, to our panellists. We're uh, uh, rapidly uh, getting up to the first 50, so we will get ourselves underway once we get to that. So if you have just joined us, welcome again. You're in the right place for the Chamber web chat for this Friday, and we are just about to get underway. So once you're comfortable, just to point out once again to those who've just joined us and their audio has just clicked in, uh, there is a Q&A box at the bottom which you can ask questions to. There's a chat box for those who want to leave comments. And it is high time that we started by introducing our guests. Uh, the subject today that we're talking about is um, a future for tourism, question mark, or not question mark. We'll find out over the next hour. Uh, we're joined by a leading attraction CEO from Jersey Zoo. I was so used to calling it Daryl when they told me off for calling it Jersey Zoo, and now they encourage Jersey Zoo. Dr. Leslie Dickey, great to have you with us. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we've also got the uh, MD of um, Channel Island Travel Group, the CI Travel Group, and that's Robert McKenzie. Robert, thank you for being with us as well. Uh, the CEO of Condor Ferries, who I would imagine have had a very quiet time, but might be having a very busy time in the next couple of months, and that's Paul Luxon, and also the uh, CEO of Visit Jersey. Within his, I think, last couple of months of tenure, I think it was to be is uh, Keith uh, Beecham. Keith, good to have you with us as well. And welcome to those uh, who've joined us already. Um, just to reiterate, there is a Q&A and a chat box that you can ask questions. The question that we're asking, is there a future for uh, the visitor economy in Jersey? One certainly hopes so. Um, I, think, I think first I've got to come to you, Keith, and say, um, are we likely to see tourists this summer now I know that's a little bit like looking in the crystal ball at the moment but um, are, are you confident that, that there there will be visitors and we will have a hotel bed sold? Uh, well a, a one word answer yes but that's predicated on so many other things I think we need um, obviously a regime at our borders which is both respecting the health concerns that we have but um, is practical for our carriers sea and air to bring people here Clearly, we've got to have the confidence that the experiences here in Jersey are going to be wonderful when people come here and then a little bit of the marketing behind all of that. Um, but we're getting very, very, very close to a line that we don't want to cross over. We talk about three winters in the sector. We've had one winter. We're still in a winter which should be summer and potentially we're going into our third winter. We have to do everything we can respecting the health concerns to avoid a three winter scenario. I'll unmute myself. There we go. We'll come back and pick up on some of those points in just a second from that. Uh, Robert, from, from one of those people that are, are managing visitors coming into the island with the CI Travel Group, uh, Keith mentioned we're getting close to a line of serious damage. How close to that line are we? Uh, I think we're pretty close. I think Keith is right. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm talking to hoteliers most days. Um, they're exceptionally worried about uh, you know, the season being lost completely. I mean, you've got to remember that, you know, in a lot of cases, hotels can't just open their doors tomorrow. Uh, they need uh, they need a, a couple of weeks to get things up and running, to get all their staff in, uh, and they have to get the staff in some cases. They have to train them. There's a lot of health and safety issues, obviously, particularly in the current um, scenario. Um, and so, you know, if we say that we're already looking at the beginning of July um, before they are likely to be able to open, you know, that's giving them 10 to 12 weeks of, of uh, seasonal operation at the most. Um, you're, you're getting close to a point where it really doesn't make commercial sense to open the hotel. Um, and coupled with that, I think, is uh, a concern over uh, when the borders hopefully do open, uh, how much capacity will, be, will there be in terms of uh, flight uh, seats? 
uh, and uh, and um, obviously condor condor availability. Um, and will that be sufficient, bearing in mind that seats are also being occupied by residents and, and, and VFR people visiting friends and relatives from the UK, is will there be sufficient capacity to accommodate staying leisure visitors? Uh, and if there isn't, then, uh, you know, there's no point in the hotels opening. Now, some hotels have already made the decision not to open. Uh, some, I would say, are a couple of weeks away from doing that. Some may, may decide that they can wait a little bit longer, but we are reaching a tipping point in my view, and I would agree with Keith uh, entirely on that. So uh, the, the call that it's urgent is, is probably the right thing, isn't it? This is, this is urgent stage right now. Yes, in terms of getting the borders open to allow commercial flying and to allow Paul to start sailing his vessels from, from the UK and France, it, it's critical now. This morning or this afternoon, uh, you know, I heard for the first time the chief minister say that, you know, they are working towards the borders reopening by the middle of July, uh, which is obviously encouraging news, but we don't know the detail of quarantining and testing. And that's going to be critical to the whole thing as well, because frankly, if people got to still quarantine for 48 hours, you can forget any visitors coming to the island. It's just just not going to happen in any any volume. Mm. Um, again, we'll come back and pick up on some of those points there because that, that is quite concerning. Um, Leslie, we we know you as, as Josie Zoo and as an attraction that we all love to go and have some time off and some downtime and, and, and have a, a really great walk around the, the environment you've got there. But but you are also the innkeeper as well, aren't you? You've got the glamping sites, you've got mm -hmm. you've got uh, stay, staying uh, accommodation there. So how vital is that to Jersey Zoo in the, in the structure mm -hmm. of Jersey Zoo itself? Well, it's really important, you know, we have, as you say, we're known in the zoo, but we're also, um, we have retail outlets, we have um, uh, dining outlets, we have uh, accommodation outlets, and of course all those things were really made to diversify income and to make it a safer proposition. Mm. And of course all the things that we diversified were impacted equally, so the diversification, you know, di didn't help us. Um, I certainly share Keith and Robert's concerns that if we don't see a change in access to the island uh, very soon then yes we're into that three winter scenario and I'm also concerned about what that access looks like. Now of course um, we can fully see that people will want to have safe access because we've we've done well in controlling the virus on the island, people are concerned about opening up, I understand those fears and uh, the manner in which opening up happens will have knock-on effects. For example, if we have that 48-hour quarantine or even 72-hour quarantine, which is the experience of some people I know recently on the Lifeline flights, then yes, I, I can't see visitors making that commitment. Certainly, we will have no weekend tourism. You know, that short stay, four-day st stay tourism, that's gone. Um, and also, I would be concerned from a hotelier point of view if people do want to take the risk and they go into a 48 hour quarantine, are we somehow as accommodation providers meant to police this? You know, I don't want to get into the situation of, you know, uh, people come and stay at our glamping site and they're there for two weeks and they're meant to be in 48 hour quarantine. If they go off site, where does that responsibility lie? That puts the hotelier, the accommodation provider in a very tricky situation. So I think there's just, a whole bunch of things that we really need some clarity on and we need preparation time for that clarity. Um, Paul, no, no, no pressure whatsoever on the carriers then, uh, whether you're air or sea. Uh, everyone's looking at you and I think what, I did see a, um, a, a Facebook post, I think, of the rapids that are moving up and down the harbour in Poole and I think that got an awful lot of people quite excited. I don't know whether you did that deliberately or not, but everyone started getting really, I've never seen a tweet retweeted so quickly. Um, so, so, so what's happening with Condor? Yeah, thanks and, and hello to all of your, your members, Murray. Uh, look, I, I think first of all, the public health had to come first in this crisis. I don't think any of us would disagree with that. I think we've all realized that economic health has become very important now. And of course, with that tourism, hospitality health. So the balance between economic and uh, tourism health with still protecting people is very important. 
Uh, I don't think any of us would want to be politicians making decisions because very hard to make the right decisions. But I'd echo what everybody said. We're going to have to take some baby steps, but they need to be pretty frequent and, and, and significant baby steps because we will get back to normal. And as Keith said, Jersey, fantastic island. Uh, people will want to come. But just, just as we moved into uh, lockdown and the COVID crisis management, moving out is proving to be more difficult. It, it's harder. It's more complex. Uh, and therefore, we need to be supportive of each other. But we do need, when Robert said, you know, perhaps some words around mid-July as borders opening and travel being permitted, that's music to my ears. I mean, we're, we haven't heard that formally yet. Uh, but yeah, give, give us the green light to at least start. We are going to have three winters. Even if we get any summer now, it's still going to be three winters on the bounce for this industry. And we're all going to have to bear that. But what we need to do is to start getting back into bringing passengers and visitors to the island safely, but we've got to start that process. How much clarity um, have you had and how much notice do you need to get Condor up and running again? Well, it's not too bad about the notice because we did, we did try and make a proactive uh, play last month when we said we were going to prepare to be able to operate services from the 19th of June you know, to today. Um, and, but, but obviously we recognised that was subject to uh, Government of Jersey and public health, green light, you know, successful pilot testing uh, and all the rest of it. So we, we wanted to demonstrate that we were, we were biting at the, at, at the bit to be able to get, get going again. So the answer is we are ready to go. Uh, we, we've got everything set up. Repeat, just stretching her legs in Pool, pool Harbour was just a demonstration of that. So a uh, very, very short period of time for us, Murray, to get going because we've done all of the planning, all of the social distancing and the safety protocols in terms of on board. We've got reduced caps on uh, capacity on each of the ships to, to, to give people more space. All of that's in play. So um, not, not much time at all. Uh, and we're, we're, we're just waiting for that green light. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask, ask a further question to that. And that is, I'm, I'm assuming like all carriers, whether you're Condor or BA or EasyJet, whoever it might be, that, that you're, you're talking to government almost on a daily basis, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Yes, and all the way through from, from literally day one, there's been good dialogue. We've been working in partnership, trying to understand. Um, I guess it's fair we're probably being slightly more irritating than them to us because we, we desperately want to get clarity because in business, whatever the business is, you can make your decisions whether they're investment decisions or operational decisions based on clarity or certainty. So, so yeah, we've been pressing to try and encourage and what can we do to help that process of getting to a level of comfort from the public health advisory set side of things uh, to, to be able to start the process of bringing people safely into the island. Mm. Um, Robert, I see you were nodding there about the clarity. The clarity is so important because there is, as you said, there is an awful lot to do before we get to that stage. So, um, I almost feel that we, you know, not that I want everyone's weekend to be ruined, but I almost feel as if the, that the whole in industry needs to be dug down in a bunker somewhere, sorting this out over an entire weekend. So there's a plan because I don't see that there is a plan. I see that there is a noise that we might have this or we, we it might be in July that we open things up. But you kind of need everyone around one table right now, don't you? Yeah, well, look, I, I think everybody has been around one table. and I think there's been a, a great deal of discussion and, and conversation within the industry. Um, the, the, Paul's absolutely spot on. What business needs is certainty. I mean, we cannot plan until we know when the borders are going to be open and on what basis they are going to open. Now, we've had this trial of testing at the airport which I think has been going on now for almost three weeks. And, um, you know, we've had absolutely no feedback on that trial. Uh, actually, that's not correct, because the other thing that John LaFondre announced in this, uh, this interview with Radio Jersey this, this afternoon was that there's been over a thousand tests, he said, and there have been zero positive uh, uh, cases from those tests. Now, you know, we haven't seen the actual data, but, you know, take it at face value. It's quite clear that the risk from people coming into the island from the UK, and this is totally from the UK on the lifeline services, is zero. 
or very close to it. So, you know, going back to the point that um, uh, Paul was making about uh, uh, the health of the public versus the health of the economy, of course it's a balance. And, and who would be a politician having to make these decisions? But that's why they're elected and they need to make these decisions. And, and in my view, the risk to the public is clearly extremely low uh, if you were to open the borders and allow allow people to come in. Um, now, then we get on to the testing, and you know, I need to. We need to know. We need to know what is the ba what is the testing scenario going to be when they open the borders? Because of, as I've already said, if they are what they are now, forget it. If they're managing to the talk about them finding a test that produces a result within a very short space of time, maybe within an hour, then yeah, that could work. That that will be enough to allow people to to make a decision to come here. But we don't know, and you know, time is ticking, and uh, uh, we we need to know what's going on. Um, economic health. I used as a phrase that you used, Paul. There, which I, I think is is worth us you know, exploring a little bit further. And we asked the question on our, our, almost as a, a teaser on our, our, our Twitter promotion of this today, which was, um, what would Jersey look like without a visitor economy? You know, what, what would the effects be? Um, Keith, you're probably the best to answer that. And um, I've, I've, I've reshared the infographic, the famous ice cream infographic many times over. Uh, yeah. Because it's a real eye opener for people. Because people, you know, sometimes don't think the visitor economy actually affects them. But but it's amazing how deep it runs, isn't it? Well, it it, it is, as you say. Our our ice cream uh, pictorial explains that. I mean, just to put the economic side and then perhaps the uh, the societal side. Um, last year, two hundred eighty million pounds was spent in Jersey by our visitors. Those are business people, residents. Uh, sorry, uh, visiting friends and relatives coming here, seeing residents, business, and holiday. If you do the maths, that works out. Uh, we are losing five hundred pounds every minute that we are not open to the rest of the world. Uh, that's a lot of money that isn't coming into our economy and then circulating. So that's a kind of direct economic um, impact. If you do, again, some maths, about 14% of the GST of the island is paid by our visitors who come. So we're losing 14% of that government tax take. 65% um, of the passenger movements through our air and seaports are by our uh, friends who come here uh, as visitors. So again, start to imagine what Jersey would be like without this number of people coming throughout the year. I mean, Leslie has got uh, Jersey Zoo. I would argue that's part of Jersey's DNA. If we don't have visitors coming, I think it's going to be, and I know uh, 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 Leslie was on the news last week saying how difficult it would be to remain a viable proposition, a charity, without the visitors supporting. Think of our heritage sector, our castles, Jersey Heritage, the National Trust, if we haven't got visitors coming here, enjoying that and spending money, our 106, 108,000 uh, population is not big enough to support these assets that we've got. And they're world-class assets. So the Hook Bee, wonderful place, one of the world's oldest um, man-made structures there. So we should be rightly proud of the, what we have in this island, but it is subsidized to some extent by our visitors who come here. And I was talking to someone this morning, um, ju just take a bakery, for example, I won't name any bakeries, um, but that bakery will be supplying buns to the hotels, the restaurants. If we degrade our hotels and restaurants, if visitors aren't coming, those buns won't be baked and therefore that bakery will have a knock-on effect and that will impact the business. You could say the same for a car uh, repair shop in terms of the repairs that they're doing for all the different vehicles in the visitor economy. So the visitor economy has tentacles that stretch out across our island and impact in so many different ways. And so there's a massive economic impact, 500 pounds a minute that we're losing, but potentially we lose all of the things which makes Jersey a really special place. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Keith. Um, 500 pounds a minute, 
uh, Paul, that, that probably means that actually the first week in July would be better than the second week in July by an awful lot of money. Um, I'm assuming from a, from a Condor business perspective, uh, you're just having to hold your breath and, and hope that you can get back to trading again, because as a commercial company, that's a pretty, you know, like you all are, uh, that's a really difficult position that you're in right now. Well, I just, I, I just doubled down on Keith's point, first of all, because I think the 280 million is right. But actually, it's double that. Because when you think about the, the uh, extended multiplier benefit of what tourism does, uh, it, it soon exponentially grows. And I think the other piece is the fabric. Jersey, without the visitor economy, wouldn't have as many restaurants and wouldn't have as many good restaurants, wouldn't have as many bars. And, and, and even the high street retailers would, you know, again, it would be more difficult. So uh, back to your core question, Murray, uh, Jersey without tourism really, well, it's, it's eggs on toast without the eggs, isn't it, really? Um, and from our point of view, uh, from the middle of March, we lost all passenger revenue and a massive outflow of refunds as well. Uh, and that was our very busiest booking time. That period, March, April, May, is the, is the most intense booking period for, you know, I, I'd, I'd imagine the same as uh, for airlines as well. So massive impact. Uh, we obviously still have operated the freight business and we uh, hopefully kept the islands you know, well, well, well supplied throughout this period. But uh, in our worst week, we were 40% down on freight volumes. So our business, our revenues have been hit very, very hard. We've had to completely re-engineer the business uh, and we continue to do that. Answer to your question, yes. The sooner, sooner we can make those baby steps, those first steps of introducing passenger service and then build gradually, incrementally as we feel more comfortable and it's safe, then we'll get back to what the new normal is going to look like, whatever that is. Mm. Uh, actually, um, uh, Kevin has just come in. Uh, Kevin Hart from uh, the, the bus service that we so much enjoy here in Jersey. Uh, an excellent bus service. That he said, uh, the visitor economy, uh, the bus service would look very different too. Uh, we'd be back to pre-2013 levels of service as our visitors uh, put in the region of two and a half to three million pounds of revenue, which subsidizes the winter service. So it's the effect of one against the other. Robert, would you see... Um, and I can be careful how I do this without worrying people. Um, but but would you would you see that we would end up with um, more expensive flights? I mean, right now, for what flights there are, um, if we haven't got many of them, they're going to be more expensive per ticket, aren't they? Well, in the short term, that that may very well be the case. I mean, it's all about um, uh, you know capacity uh, and price. So, you know. If you look back to 2019, the summer of 2019, we had nine EasyJet routes, uh, as, as well as a number of, uh, of Flybe routes, um, uh, and, and obviously BA and all the others. But, but clearly EasyJet had grown their capacity into the island significantly. Um, and as a result of which, you know, fares were extremely competitive and, uh, you know, the, there's no doubt that part of part of the reason for the growth in our tourism numbers over the last decade has been down to EasyJet. I mean, we just have to simply recognise that. And um, so let, let's take a scenario, the middle of July, the borders are open, there's, there's a, pro, a, 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 a regime in place, either no testing or, or very straightforward testing, that means that EasyJet, and they've said this, they will restart services. Uh, but they won't restart services with nine routes operating, you know, multiple frequency and so on. There'll, there'll be probably two or three routes initially, maybe one flight a day, two flights a day. So, you know, we are simply not going to have the capacity that we normally have. And that means that prices are probably going to be higher. But in the long term, providing we can get through this and we can get through the three winters, I'm very optimistic about 2021. I think Jersey's in a very good place to benefit from the recovery that we're gonna see in our industry. Um, but to be honest, I'm not really focused on that right now. I'm focused on uh, trying, trying to maximize uh, any business that we can get this summer uh, and, and help to boost the coffers because we've got a long winter ahead uh, uh, in this island. With, with obviously, you know, a winter where we don't see large numbers of, of visitors. Um, good Murray. to have you. Yeah, sure, Paul. Yeah. So, sorry to interrupt. Um, I was just going to say from a Condor point of view, uh, clearly our business has been massively impacted by this and of course is going to be for a while going forward. 
what we've done with the uh, revised schedule for the summer, we looked at our uh, demand, so the bookings that we had through June, July, August, September, and we've then looked at a schedule, a revised schedule that would accommodate that demand. The last thing we've thought about is doing anything in terms of affecting fares. So we switched our staircase pricing, the dynamic pricing model that all operators use. We switched that off at the beginning of this process because we didn't. what we didn't want to do was to escalate fares. I mean, it might have been quite attractive in a way from us commercially in terms of yield from higher fares. But what we recognized is that we needed to actually get people traveling again rather than traveling and looking to try to optimize those fares. So from a Condor point of view, you know, as, as commercially and financially as attractive as some fair lifts might have been, uh, we, we absolutely have, have just said that's not the way to go. We need to get we need to get the osmosis flow of passengers back into the island. Um, there is there is a whole confidence issue here, isn't there, for visitors, uh, even for locals who um, the, the job of uh, worrying people over health and keeping them indoors has been done very very well. Actually, now giving them some confidence to come back outside again is is probably a bit bit tougher i mean leslie do you share that optimism for 2021 do you think you can get through 2020 do you think the 2021 i mean we've got the product haven't we yeah yeah we've got we've got the product and um you know keith and his team have worked very hard over the last few years giving that really dynamic message about jersey i think we've got a lot to offer you know as as you know keith and robert have been saying you know there's a lot on this island when we look at the catchment of 108,000 people. There's a lot of restaurants, there's a lot of attractions, there's lots of hotels, so there's a lot to offer. So if we can get through this period, then yes, I, I think 2021 could be good. And I, I noticed on the Q&A, someone's made the point that perhaps in the past, Jersey Zoo had a lot more visitors. And I think this is what's really frustrating. Yeah, back in the 80s and 90s, Jersey Zoo had about 350,000 visitors a year. Very high. And then from nine, if you're the, this century, um, the average rolling average over 10 years up till 2018 was 188,000 visitors. And we at the Zoo, my team and I, we, we'd worked really hard over 18, 17 to prepare. And we'd actually gone from 188 average to in 2019, 240,000 visits. We'd done really well. We felt very prepared for 2020. You know, we were confident going into 2020. Um, you know, the, the offer of the whole island was really positive. So it's a real, you know, kick in the teeth that we're seeing what we're seeing now. And at the moment, we're 93% down on paid admissions at the zoo. Wow. So it's, it's really chunky. Um, it's, do, you, do you have another plan? Is there, a, you know, you've been on the news this week. We've, we've heard a great deal um, and I know that you've had tremendous support from the locals who will come up and will come and see you. A lot of them are already members, um, which yeah. is great, but they're it's already great. members. But yeah. presumably, you know, somehow like every business, you've got to look from now until the end of the year and spring next year and go, how do we get from here to here? Yeah. Um, we are and we, we are looking at, okay, let's if we think we're not going to have that um, visitor economy there is a staycation economy but we have to also be realistic that we can't um, support our entire tourism economy via staycations um, i'm sure the island will rally together and, and really um, help but again that when it comes back to something about clarity uh, going forward you know, we've got the glamping site, we know people are interested in staycations, but we also have bookings from Britain and France, and those people don't want to relinquish their bookings until they understand what's going on. So there's a little uh, tricky situation where we could potentially have more staycations in our glamping site from residents on the island who are being fantastic and who are being incredibly supportive and buying memberships and adoptions and really being fabulous. But we've also got our visitor economy tourism, tourism um, that they, they still want to come to the island. There's a whole bunch of people who still want to come to the island and they want us to hold their bookings. So I'm sure there's a lot of hoteliers who would be in that same situation, guest house, other camping sites, who are kind of a rock and a hard place thinking local staycations, but these people also want to hold their bookings. So 
you know, going back to what we were saying at the start, the, the earlier we can have some clarity, the easier these decisions are for us in the tourism industry thinking about, okay, we can cancel those bookings and refund those visitors, or we can maybe carry them over into next year. We've also had a lot of that. We've had a lot of our visitors for this year at our glamping site, very happy to transfer into 2021, which gives us a bit of confidence for 2021, that we know that people want to come to the island and they, they're going to keep, they're going to do that transfer. So we've already got bookings for next year. And I'm sure for other hoteliers, they might be seeing a similar thing. So if we can get through this point, I think we could have confidence about 21. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring in um, uh, France and even Germany in just a second into the question. But before we do that, just want to go through the staycation side of it. And probably this goes back to you, Keith, more than anyone, because I know it's been part of the strategy. You know, taking a steer from other, and this is a question that came in, taking a steer from other tourism dependent jurisdictions, what is the potential for local residents and businesses to partially offset the lost inbound traffic through staycations, team events, active patronage of local attractions and restaurants? You know, has that been assessed? That was one of the questions we had. And there was another question, I think which was about Malta, where they were issuing 100 euro, 100 pound, um, whatever their currency is, 100 of, um, uh, to, to uh, people to use in local restaurants and local hotels. So there's some thinking there. Um, how valuable is the staycation, Keith? Well, it's not the answer, but it's, it's getting us through this particular point in time. So to rely on the staycation or what we're calling rediscover home um, is really helping the businesses now, but it certainly will not support the businesses throughout the summer. It's not that demand is insufficient. So if I just give you an example of that. Last year, we had 2.74 million overnights here in Jersey. I don't think our local market will be able to generate 2.74 million overnights here in Jersey. But generating some overnights is certainly really uh, helpful and very much uh, uh, in, in terms of what the, our hoteliers are saying, it's really important that we all get out there and enjoy the island. So we and others are trying to put together these, you know, a call to action almost, you know, your island needs you, it's time to enjoy and perhaps in discover some of the parts of the island that you're not aware of. We've got very much an east and west island here. We'll perhaps go and enjoy each other's um, sides of the island. You're asking, a, you're asking a lot now, Keith. You're asking someone from I'm Snowden to get a Gory. Yeah, I mean, to discover Gory there, um, I think, Murray. But it's really important that people do enjoy the island. They do get out there and, in, and have a fantastic time. But it is not, it's, it's not the answer. It's the sticking plaster to get us to the next place, which is really to get our markets um, open and then to get our visitors returning. Okay, all right. It's, it's, it helps, but it's, it's not the answer. Um, what is Guernsey doing this, this summer is a question from Mike. And I, actually, I, I, I wonder how much of a difference the Guernsey situation has on Condor Ferries because, you know, we hear talk of, Condor ferries uh, running from possibly uh, from here to France, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, and from the UK, but nowhere near the island that it would normally stop off on, Paul. Is that a complication for you that we've got two different systems running in two different islands? Uh, well, we've got four different systems because obviously Jersey, Guernsey, France, the UK, but I take your point, Murray. So um, Guernsey went into the lockdown and the crisis differently to Jersey, France and England. Uh, and they're coming out of it. They've got a six, six phase. Uh, the sixth phase was September, and that's when open travel would be permitted, uh, or earlier if things went well. Uh, phase five, which was pretty much completely unlocked, which is happening from this weekend, and travel within the Guernsey Bailiwick. Um, so, so it's fair to say Guernsey had a, a very clear definitive position early on, which was a bit disappointing for us because it meant no travel until September, it sounded like. But at phase four, three weeks ago, it was announced non-essential travel would be allowed. But still, the testing had to be sorted out. So Guernsey were clear, nothing for all summer. They're now sort of revisiting that and, and we're in dialogue with them. But yes, it would be much easier for us operating an integrated ferry company for the Channel Islands. It would be much better that we had all of those islands in sync. Because it's not much good running a ferry if you leave somewhere, but you can't get into the place that you're going to. Um, so working together with them all, there's dialogue between 
the islands and with France. I know both Guern the states of Guernsey and government of Jersey are talking to France around exemptions and how it might work. Um, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful that some of those maybes will become realities and that will help unlock and let us get busy with those first baby steps of travel. That's, that's my hope. Um, I, I'm, I'm probably going to come back to you, Keith, in terms of the market for France and for, for Germany, because there's a question in back. Do, do the panel think that visitors from France and Germany might become more important this year than those from the UK, given the, the level of recovery that we're getting from uh, from Germany and in, in areas of France, particularly, I mean, Brittany and Normandy, areas like that have got low levels of COVID. So is there a possibility there, Keith, that, that we, can, we can make some hay there? Well, I certainly, um, it's a possibility. I, I mean, just to give you an idea, it's our second most important market after, of course, the UK in both visits, nights and spend. And we had, um, I think it was about 130,000 French people coming last year, spending 17 million uh, pounds here. So important market. Uh, obviously, we rely ex uh, on uh, Condor to bring, there's no air, of course, so Condor is really important. And obviously, we, uh, through our PR agency, we're working in France. There's been some announcements, though, in, in France from the Prime Minister down that it's the French people's duty to holiday at home in France this year. So we've got um, a, a political tone being played out in France which is actively discouraging people from uh, from traveling so I think we just we have to bear that in mind but the principle of is there an opportunity then the answer of course must be yes okay um, and, and again Paul just coming back to you on that um, there is uh, th there, there is a market there in France and getting into Somalo has, has got to be one of the attractive things that you, you're trying to do um, the French are making all sorts of noises about this being possible and are very keen. Um, have you any, any extra news on that that we don't know? I'm going to have to ask you to unmute. There you go. Sorry about, sorry about that, Murray. Thank you. Um, from our point of view, absolutely, we would like to see that, that southern route open. We know how important it is for Jersey and it's important for us as well. Um, I, I think the most important bit is... Uh, uh, France said borders were closed till the 15th of June and that they would be open from the 16th of June. As long as Jersey and Guernsey had the 14-day quarantine uh, on arrival, as long as that was in place, that seemed to undermine everything. Of course, that situation has changed now. We just need the public health and uh, the government, of government to be able to get comfortable and just relax some of the constraints, not recklessly, carefully, but we've got to start. If we don't start, we're not going to be able to see what works and what doesn't. Hmm. All right. Well, we, we are we are waiting to see uh, how that will develop and how it will move forward. Um, David's asked a question, which is, is it time to have a fresh look at multi-destination ferry holidays? Oh, you wish. Um, uh, we might even have a link up with Brittany Ferries Network, or is it too early to be talking about that, Paul? Oh, look, it, it, it's too early. Every ferry operator, every airline is in distress, turmoil, uh, and whatever else you want to describe. So now's not the time to be looking almost at sort of innovation around that sense. But you know, with, with our new sort of minority shareholder, Brittany Ferries, we have had conversations about what could it look like in terms of working together to feed into each other's networks. But all of those talks were put on hold the minute this happened back in, back in March. So that's one for the future, I think, to begin with. Let's get some ferries operating, let's get some flights operating, and then worry about the nuance of those new new elements flights and ferry capacity yes yeah, sorry uh, robert come on in uh, yeah. so i just wanted to make a comment about germany actually uh, i mean uh, another thing that got announced i mean you should all listen to this bbc jersey interview with the chief minister because he suddenly seems to have become much more uh, vocal about about the opening really? up of the island yeah absolutely mm -hmm at long last. So uh, the other thing he mentioned was air corridors. So it's the first time I've heard him talk about those. So he's now saying that there is a distinct possibility, a probability that Jersey will be able to establish air corridors with destinations with uh, low incidence of COVID. Now, of course, Germany is one of those countries with uh, probably one of the lowest instances of COVID currently in, in, in the country. Um, and uh, you know, from uh, we obviously work closely with a lot of the German, uh, Austrian and Swiss tour operators, and they are very keen 
to still operate uh, services in July and August uh, through through to the end of the uh, September season. Uh, so I'm again, I'm delighted to hear that. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that and quickly, please, uh, because those operators are are uh, they bring high value. They spend a lot of money when they're here. They love to go around all the attractions. Uh, the, uh, Jersey Zoo, as well as the heritage sites, uh, and if we can get some, and they stay seven nights because they come on flights that operate uh, operate weekly. So I, I really am uh, keen that that those air corridors, if that's what they're going to be, uh, are established so we can get those flights operating this this summer. That's a really good point, Robert. Thank you for that. And, and, and Keith, you know, just coming to you on that, my memories of. Uh, of being in Berlin, extolling the virtues of those eight or nine uh, regional flights that were coming in um, in a previous job. I mean, that, that that's an important thing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I totally agree with uh, Robert's observation there. I mean, we get about 20 odd thousand uh, Germans, but they are uh, amongst our highest spending visitors for the reasons that, that Robert um, has described. And they really do enjoy our island and our attractions. So they are a, um, a really a worthwhile visitor for us to be targeting. Mm -hmm. um, just very, very quickly, um, Sarah, and many people will know Sarah, who works for Visit Jersey based in the UK, is in a constant dialogue with the tour operators in the UK, in Germany, Austria, and elsewhere. And it, just to paraphrase what she's uh, passing on to me, is that there is interest from the German market in coming to Jersey. They haven't fallen out of love with the island. Their customers are still keen uh, to come. They just need the barriers to be taken away. And, and to echo Robert's point, if we can have some kind of corridor, um, then I think we can look at that German market. It is a charter driven market. So that has some complexities about it. But certainly consumer sentiment in Germany is still positive towards uh, our island. Good, 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 good. Thank you for that. A uh, question for Paul, which concerns actually air capacity, but goes on to Condor. Um, and it was from Stephen who said, if we were able to open our borders and there is a flight capacity shortage, uh, will Condor be in a position to put on extra capacity where needed? So that plan that I talked about uh, back in May that we put forward to begin uh, restart a, a revised schedule from the 19th of June, that was looking at two rotations a week around the weekend on the northern route and, and up to four rotations a, a week on the southern route. So the, the answer, Murray, is what we've tried to do is to put on a, a, a kind of a revised schedule that would let people get away, uh, both people that have got homes in France or people visiting and whatever. So, um, yeah, look, within the confines of commercial doability, because it is fair to say, you know, we've really been hit hard. So we, we, we have to be careful about making sure we don't in, increase our losses as such. But yes, of course, uh, we'd look to be flexible. Um, any scope for day trips to and from France? Is, is day trips a, a, different, a different thing, Paul, to, you know, just ferry crossings? Is there some way that you can just have people, oh, we seem to have lost you off screen, but we'll get you back in a minute. Um, but I just wonder if there is, uh, Ian was asking that question, day trips to and from France. I think it's part of the same thing. You're waiting, aren't you? I, I think the only trouble with day trips is, depending on what the constraints are, if you're going somewhere for a day and you, you have to have tests and things like that. But, but look, the service that we, the service revised schedule would, facilitate those day trips if that's practicable if it's allowed all right well let's just see where that goes and we'll uh, we'll come back and talk about that a little bit more um in in terms of um i'm just actually the the the, the german speaking market which is the german and, and, and the swiss market i'm imagining for jersey zoo again that's the, they're, they're one of your key visitors aren't they yeah it is a absolute truism that, that germans love visiting zoos there's about 800 zoos and wildlife parks in Germany alone. They are really keen. So we really do appreciate, it's not, it's not the biggest part of our market, but they tend to ensure that the, the zoo is one of the things that they stop at uh, when they're on the island. Um, and certainly if there is an opportunity for air corridors or air bridges in some way, mm. Germany would be a good market for the zoo as well. Absolutely. Uh, just going back to that voucher idea, and it's been floated around quite a bit. I know Keith has had some conversation on this as well, and I'm assuming that Jersey Zoo would have done. If it hasn't, I wonder if it's interested. Um, and it actually was from the 10th of June edition of the Times. They reported on a programme in Malta. It was 100 euro vouchers were distributed 
to Maltese residents to use in local hotels and restaurants and presumably attractions. Uh, the potential of such a program here, I mean, it's kind of like the dingo dollar challenge, isn't it? Um, I, ju I, just, I just wonder if, uh, and I don't want it to be called the dingo dollar, but I just wonder if that voucher system of government spend is a great way to get into the attractions with a direct spend. Um, Jersey Zoo would certainly be up for that. Absolutely, and you know, obviously the government is looking at the different phases of, of uh, coming out of, of the situation we've been in and thinking about the recovery phase and, phase. and of course, fiscal stimulus is going to absolutely be part of that recovery phase. And there will be a lot of um, discussion about what that fiscal stimulus is going to look like. There'll obviously be a lot of discussion about infrastructure and transport, but we need to ensure, of course, that fiscal stimulus into the staycation market is an idea that gets discussed. Um, the, the, they're not kind of mutually exclusive thinking about what can we do to get the external visitors back. But if there was um, a stimulus into that kind of voucher idea, certainly I think that could be a really interesting thing because I also think it would help with, you know, mental well-being on the island. There's been a lot of people um, very stressed by this lockdown situation. Um, you know, the phrase, we're all in it together, clearly we're not, because some people don't have gardens, some people don't have outside space. So there would be multiple benefits, I think, from a potential of a scheme like that, that go beyond helping us in the tourism economy, but also helping the island feel safe to go out, as we, we talked earlier about that confidence of going out. And perhaps that scheme would also engender some of that confidence again, which would further have knock-on effects. Hmm. Um, question, actually, I, I suspect Robert and, and Keith on this one and, and others want to come in, uh, from Richard, who said, if the restrictions are lifted and say during August, uh, we, we, we're back to restrictions lifted and we've got some trade going and it's that short time, is there a chance that the season could be extended artificially new events jersey activities marketing in that that late summer uh in terms of marketing and i i i guess that that's that's almost an obvious but I, you know I, I just wonder what your thoughts are on that because i just think that you know there is an opportunity to go a bit bit longer keith isn't there yes uh, what in fact that's part and parcel of what visit jersey's strategy has been for the last five years is to extend that uh, season and i won't bore you with all the numbers but if effectively we are extending the seasons now um, out in or the shoulder season. So uh, absolutely, yes. And I think events play a significant role in our ability to do that, both sporting events uh, as well as indoor events. And uh, you know, Super League Triathlon is one example. Festival of Words, perhaps, is another example of events that are happening at that part of the year. We've also, I think, the businesses here in Jersey have invested over the last four or five years in their, um, let's call it wellness experience. And that could be anything from yoga on the beach to a five star yoga experience in our hotels. A lot of investment has gone on in that product that can be enjoyed throughout the year, particularly into autumn, winter, etc. So our product is diversifying. Our visitors are increasingly prepared to come outside the summer season. And so in a kind of strange way, COVID is is giving us an extra kick up the backside to continue that drive into the autumn and into winter. Mm. The, the Mark, yes, Leslie, by all means, please. I just, to pick up on the events, you know, obviously um, the zoo, we, of, we often talk to Keith and his team about potential events, etc. And we are thinking about, for 2021 and 2022, bringing forward large events that might have been not happening until 22, 23. So we're trying to think from the perspective if um, we just have to accept that this year is, is done, if we don't get the, the, the economy back in terms of tourism, but what can we do in 21 to really drive visitation? What additional events that we weren't budgeting to put on, but might be prudent to bring forward. And we had a couple of things in mind that I certainly think that we will consider putting on larger events in 2021 and making the investment if we can then to kickstart next year mm. on, and to reestablish that, you know, that there's lots of things going on in Jersey and into 22 and 23, because this might take a few years. Robert, just going back to the, thank you, Leslie, for that. And I think you're absolutely right. Uh, just looking at this extended summer, 
um, and being able to sell that. I'm guessing there's an awful lot of people who haven't been able to use their holidays since, well, for this year. They would have started around about March time right the way through. And so there's a lot of people accruing holidays, sitting uh, probably not in their office, but at home. Um, but they will be going back to work in August, September time and then applying for some holiday leave, which they've got to use by the end of the year. So there's some opportunity here, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. And uh, if, uh, you know, the, uh, the whole border situation is sorted out and, and I, I think uh, there is a real opportunity to see greater volume coming through uh, the end of September into October. Uh, of course, assuming there is the capacity on boats and plane, uh, planes to get them there. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we are working ourselves and talking to suppliers about how that could could work. Um, so I suspect it will be a little bit driven by how the market, how, how we see the market react once the borders are, are open. Uh, if demand is, 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 is strong, then I think that will give encouragement to uh, the carriers to maybe increase capacity uh, in, in the autumn uh, and, uh, and for hoteliers, particularly the seasonal hoteliers, to, to extend, that, extend the season. But um, so, so yes, I, I think there will be uh, interest uh, and demand, uh, providing of course we don't uh, come across any other bumps in the road second spikes and all those sort of dreadful things um but yeah i remain at this point in time optimistic about the the season moving later i've not even mentioned brexit i'm not going to bother there's only seven minutes today let's 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 not go there on that one uh of the questions coming in at the moment um there was a question that came in about attractions that i wanted to go to uh which was obviously without our visitors many of our attractions are understandably not opening um, including the likes of the war tunnels, which is just the most visited att attraction, probably according to them. I think, I think you're going to have an argument about that one, Leslie. Um, however, uh, if we open the borders, has any dialogue been had with any of the attractions as to make sure they're getting open again? Um, I, I guess, Leslie, you're going to say yes, and, and Keith, you're going to say yes as well. Leslie first. Yeah, no, I mean, certainly from our point of view, we were very proactive with the government um, before opening before we were allowed to open that we we put a very clear plan together for safety we gave that to the government early we talked them to early so certainly i'm sure the other attractions are doing something very similar um there, there is a, a slight dichotomy with some of the things that we did in that because we were so concerned about making people feel incredibly safe uh, to visit the zoo so we kept our indoor houses shut um, if you've been to the zoo, you know, you've got, we've got extensive screening, uh, there's hand sanitizers everywhere. And we also uh, put in place timed entry. Now, we're now at the stage where we actually think things like timed entry are becoming a hindrance to people visiting. Um, but we, you know, it was important in the early points of opening because people weren't confident. And I think they were concerned about safety. So we had to put those mitigations in. Um, and, and so I think for attractions in that opening, there is, a, there is a bit of suck it and see as you open and see how people are behaving when they come to the attraction. Do they feel comfortable? Do they feel safe? Because, of course, the mitigations that we're all putting in place are expensive. You know, there's a lot of cost to the mitigations. They take time. You know, it's not a matter of you get permission to open, you're open the next day. Um, so really for the whole attractions group, there's, there's so many different considerations. We are lucky at the zoo in that there's, when we opened, we could open as an outdoor attraction with fewer touch points. Some of the other attractions on the island, that was really not an option. It was really difficult for them. Um, but I would hope that we're soon going to get to a stage uh, of decreasing down into terms of social distancing. That'll make it much easier for the attractions. Um, and hopefully places like the war tunnels would feel confident about opening as an entirely indoor attraction then. Right. Uh, very quickly, Keith, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that you're talking to all attractions and you've got open dialogue with them as, as the days unfold, as, as we, we start talking about beginning of July. Yes, there's both, I guess, a formal way of doing that. We have the recovery steering group, which brings the industry together to discuss how we can move forward. And then informally, there's a, an awful lot of conversations 
um, one of my colleagues, Jenny, is day in, day out talking to all of the attractions, accommodation, etc., on the island. So, but we're well aware of of, of all of that. And it, I think we've used the word confidence once or twice. I think it's also about getting that confidence back um, together with the the health requirements. And we're collectively, as an industry, uh, working on a charter. The JHA is leading on this, and we're supporting that to put in place. Um, the yardsticks or the standards for accommodation, for attractions, transportation, etc., so that can give confidence to the business so that it's right and give confidence to the visitors and indeed islanders when they're using all of that. So that's work in progress at the moment. Uh, Robert, just on the, on, the, on the transportation side of it, if there's, if there's difficulties uh, and touch points when it comes to attractions, you know, people getting on and off the flight is an absolute nightmare. Um, so... In, in terms of that process of people flying and the safety at, in order to build confidence, um, that's a real issue and, and, and probably the first issue you've got to overcome. To sell a ticket, you've got to have someone feel happy at the experience of, of, of doing that, have you? Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, but that's about getting flights starting again. You have to grow confidence, getting people... Uh, reassuring people about the process and so on and so forth. Um, uh, I, I mean, the, all the flights that have been operating, the lifeline services that have been coming into the island, uh, my understanding is there's no, uh, there's no social distancing going on. People are required to make, wear, wear face masks and, uh, of course, have to complete a questionnaire and all that. Um, but uh, I, I go back to the point thousand tests in the trial not one positive case i believe has been uh, proven as a result so you know i think uh, it, it will take a little bit of time but as uh, confidence returns in traveling uh, albeit with certain uh, restrictions like wearing of masks um, bear in mind it's a relatively short flight um you know an hour hour and a half maybe um, then, uh, you know, I, I don't see that as being a particularly strong barrier to, to entry. I, I think there is one thing quickly that I would say, which is that, you know, the age group is, is an issue for this island. So, you know, we have an average age of our visitor of 57, I believe. Um, and, um, you know, we have a, a very large number of people in the autumn, September, October, who tend to be elderly. Now, they are certainly going to be less inclined to travel and may be required to uh, continue uh, self-isolating or, or, or certainly are less likely to be traveling. So that is that is certainly a concern. A thousand and, 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 none, uh, and, and no, no active cases from those tested coming on the Lifeline flights. Five known active cases as of 15 minutes ago. Uh, that's the latest numbers that we've got. Um, five active cases. Uh, and with five active cases in a population of 107,800, um, are we unnecessarily fearful in proportion to the amount of cases we've got? Public safety, economic safety, oh sorry, public health, economic health, tourism, hospitality health. It's about that those being balanced, they need to be balanced and weighed up. But we need to be confident, we need to take the first steps, Murray. We, we need to begin the journey of getting back to whatever the new normal is going to be. Uh, we've got to start taking those steps. What will sea travel look like, Paul, um, uh, at the moment? Uh, You'll have gone through it already. Yeah, I mean, we've done a lot of analysis. And of course, lots of people are doing lots of analysis. And of course, none of us really know what's going to happen because it's unprecedented. I, I guess we see people from the UK, the core tourism market, we see them being very confident about traveling to the Channel Islands as opposed to some other European uh, destinations next year. Um, we can sort of see people looking at Guernsey and Jersey's performance uh, in dealing with the pandemic. And I think both islands you know, will, 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 will be warmly seen in that sense. Um, so look, I I'm, I'm remain very optimistic. Keith said at the beginning, nothing's changed about the product of Jersey. It's still a beautiful, beautiful place and a beautiful place for tourism destination consumers. Um, we just need to make sure we give all of the encouragement and enablement to let them start returning. Jersey in July, then. That's what we're looking at. <laughs> that'll do me. That'll, yeah. Well, that'll do all of us. Fingers crossed from all of you. Uh, listen, thank you to everyone that's been... Um, uh, actually, there was a question coming in. What's Keith's experience of tourism after ZARS? But 
we're way over time, so that could take us forever right now. But I, I just wanted to thank everyone for their questions that have been coming in. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our panel for answering what was been the, the quickest hour that we've ever had, I think. Uh, Dr. Leslie Dickey from GCC, thank you very much indeed. Robert, MD at uh, CI Travel Group, thank you as always. Keith, thank you very much indeed for all that you're doing and for being with us as well. And Paul Luxon, happy sailings as soon as you can. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Have a tremendous weekend. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. <laughs>